Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, quarantine clinic. Today we'll be discussing multiple sclerosis. So this is the first time that we are discussing a demyelinating disease. When we think of our, uh, talk about multiple sclerosis, what we are actually doing is we are looking at a separate section of uh, diseases that affects the myelin in the nervous system. So before we get into what is multiple sclerosis, I thought that we could uh, have a five minute discussion on what is uh, myelin dysfunctions. Multiple sclerosis comes under this subsection. It is a subsection of diseases of myelin. Now there are two types of myelin disorders. One is when there is a genetic problem in myelin production. So that is called as dysmyelinating disorders. And the second is after the myelin has formed, there is something wrong with the myelin. So that is called demyelinating disorders. So the two types are basically dysmyelinating and demyelinating. And dysmyelinating, all the all of the disorders are genetic. So, for example, you can have adrenoleukodystrophy, or uh, Crabbe's disease, or uh, even your uh, Alexander. So, these are all different types of disorders that affects the myelin production. And today, we are not going to talk about dysmyelinating disorders. Today we are going to talk about demyelinating disorders and in demyelinating there are multiple causes for demyelination to happen and one of them is autoimmune. So when we say autoimmune we mean that your body has attacked its own cells. So you have autoimmune, you can have infectious causes of demyelination, you can have toxic causes of demyelination, you can have metabolic causes, and you can have vascular causes. So today we are going to be mainly talking about autoimmune causes of demyelination, and uh, the different types of autoimmune causes of demyelination can be, one of them is MS. So our main topic for today is MS, but this is the overall flow chart as to where MS lies inside the bigger uh, spectrum of myelin disorders. And there are other autoimmune demyelinating disorders such as ADEM and uh, NMO, that is neuromyelitis optica. So these are different uh, types of autoimmune demyelinating disorders. But today we are mainly talking about MS. Now, before we talk about MS in specific, I want you to just understand about myelin itself. What is myelin? So myelin is the protective covering that is present over axons. So we've already spoken about how a neuron has a cell body and it has an axon. And the purpose of the axon is to carry the impulse from the cell body all the way to the next neuron. So it carries the impulse, it carries nutrients. So there is, there is a lot of functions for the axon. And the myelin is a covering that is present around the axon. And if there is a problem in the myelin, then eventually there will be a problem in the axons so that is called as secondary axonal damage so if your myelin sheet is uh, affected for some reason then eventually your axon will also suffer some damage that is secondary axonal damage but all our demyelinating and dysmyelinating disorders have to do with some problem in this myelin sheath so the covering of the axon so if you look at this from a cross section, we'll see that suppose this is the axon, the myelin is actually 
like a spiral structure that is covering the axon. So this is the myelin. And this is how the uh, myelin envelops the axon. Uh, so it acts as both an insulation and it helps to transmit the information faster. So what is this? What, how does this myelin come around the axon? What, what is the process of uh, myelin sheath formation? So for that, you need to know something called as Schwann cell and oligodendrocyte. Now, what is the Schwann cell? A Schwann cell is a cell that has a, it has like a flat surface. And what the Schwann cell does is, it goes and attaches itself to the axon, and then it wraps around the axon. So it wraps its cell body around the axon, and if there are multiple Schwann cells like this, eventually this forms the myelin sheet around the axon. Okay. And Schwann cells are seen in the peripheral nervous system. So you know that in your body, you have a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system goes from your brain up to your spinal cord and your peripheral nervous system is from the roots, the plexus and the nerves. So this is the peripheral nervous system. So the Schwann cell is a part of the peripheral nervous system. So it forms a myelin sheath in the periphery and in the center that is in the brain and the spinal cord, it is the function of the oligodendrocyte to form the myelin sheath. So what is the difference between the Schwann cell and the oligodendrocyte? The Schwann cell, as I just described, is a cell which has a single uh, flat surface, whereas an oligodendrocyte has multiple flat surfaces. And what this does is a single oligodendrocyte can myelinate multiple nerve fibers. So if there is a oligodendrocyte like this, then it can wrap itself around multiple axons so that a single oligodendrocyte can myelinate multiple axons around it. Okay, so that is the main difference between Schwann cell and oligodendrocyte. And this is important in MS because when we talk about multiple sclerosis, we are dealing with a disease that affects only the central nervous system. So multiple sclerosis does not affect the peripheral nervous system. And possibly one of the reasons why that is so is because the disease affects a protein in the myelin sheath that is specific to the central nervous system. So if it was both exactly the same, then there would be no reason why there should be any difference. But now we know that because it is formed by different types of cells, then there is an inherent difference in the myelin between your peripheral nervous system and your central nervous system. And there are a lot of disorders that affect only the peripheral nervous system. For example, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome is a disorder of only the peripheral nervous system. So that, that affects the myelin sheath of your nerves, not in your brain. But multiple sclerosis affects the myelin sheath in your brain. And now we'll talk about how does it do it? How does it affect the myelin sheath? So to put it very simply, you have the axon and you have the myelin sheath around it. The myelin sheath contains proteins. It contains multiple proteins. 
now assuming that there is one particular protein against which you have auto antibody so your body's immune system in a normal person if there is a pathogen if there is an infection that enters the body your immune system has a role in attacking this pathogen and the way it attacks it is through your immune system which and that contains your innate and your adaptive immune system now this is how it should normally be but for some reason if instead of attacking a pathogen if your immune system attacks a cell of your own body that is known as autoimmunity so all your autoimmune disorders is basically your immune system attacking some organ some cell in your own body and it possibly mistakes your own cell for a pathogen and if there is an autoimmune reaction against a particular protein in your myelin then that can cause autoimmune demyelination so in all the examples i gave you of autoimmune demyelination that is in multiple sclerosis in adem in nmo uh, there are other disorders known as mog so there are multiple autoimmune demyelinating disorders but the fundamental principle of all of them is that your body's immune system attacks a protein in the central nervous system myelin that is the myelin that is formed from your oligodendrocytes what exactly happens in this so now we are talking about the pathogenesis of ms how does this happen so let's imagine that there is a there's an infection now this infection can be uh, anything it can be respiratory it can be a gi infection infection enters the cell enters the body so let's say that this is the infection okay now the first line of defense in our body is something known as sentinel cells now i want to clarify that this is core immunology and i'm not an immunologist uh, this is a very basic understanding of what is happening in our immune system i'm going to try and uh, get a colleague of mine who is an immunologist uh, to come and explain uh, autoimmunity in another discussion uh, we'll have a separate clinic for that but uh, for today i'll just give you a brief overview of how the immune system works and then we'll discuss the neurology aspect in greater detail so the first line of defense in our immune system is the sentinel cells so the sentinel cells are your uh, dendritic cells and your macrophages so these are the main uh, the main sentinel cells sentinel cells meaning they are the first line of defense they are the lookout soldiers they will pick up this infection they will pick up this pathogen they will recognize this pathogen and they will break it down how will they break it down they will initiate local microvascular changes they will call additional help they will call upon other inflammatory cells the other inflammatory cells are your neutrophils and more macrophages so monocytes and macrophages what they do is that they will break this pathogen they will phagocytose this pathogen into and then they will break it down into small components so they will break it down into peptide proteins peptide protein fragments not even the whole proteins they will break it down into peptide protein fragments and they will break it down into something known as epitopes and what these do is this is a way of trying to remember what infection happened in your body so that 
the next time this infection enters your body the response can be much faster so the peptide fragments the protein fragments will ultimately lead to t cell production so the way this happens is that uh, the protein fragments are expressed in your mhc class 1 and 2 and uh, your mhc class 1 will lead to cd8 and mhc class 2 will lead to cd4 t cells so these are two different types of t cells and for the purpose of ms discussion we are mainly concerned with cd4 t cells not cd8 t cells okay so you have your cd4 t cell production and this cd4 t cells will undergo differentiation and this will form memory t cell and effector t cell so that completes your t cell part of the picture so all of this comes under your adaptive immunity so there are two types of immunity you have your natural and adaptive and the difference between these two is that your natural is your first line of defense and your natural immunity does not vary as uh, the pathogen varies so it is the same response to all your pathogens so it is a crude effective method but your adaptive immunity is slower but it is more more effective and it is more specific so your adaptive immunity will keep changing as your pathogen changes so your t cell and b cell are both part of your adaptive immunity and your peptide fragments will cause t cell production and your epitopes will lead to b cell production uh so basically the way this happens is that these epitopes are carried to the lymph nodes the lymph nodes have the b cell the b cells will eventually they will get activated by the effector t cell and then these b cells will form memory b cell and effector b cell so both your t cell and b cell have a sort of similar flow but you need the effector t cell to stimulate the b cell production and your effector b cell forms plasma cells and plasma cells forms immunoglobulins that is antibodies so out of all this what are the two cells that we are ultimately concerned with we want to know what happens with the effector t cells and we want to know what happens with the immunoglobulin that is the plasma cells because in the end these two are the ones that will actually cause cell damage so to recap your a pathogen enters your body and ultimately you have effector t cells and you have plasma cells now the important thing to know is that these are both in your body they haven't entered the brain yet so for that for this to enter the brain it needs to go through this layer known as blood brain barrier and this is a key factor in multiple sclerosis because it doesn't matter how many effector t cells and plasma cells are there in the body but as long as they don't enter into the brain or the spinal cord they will not cause multiple sclerosis so the only way they can enter is if there is a a breach in the blood brain barrier so for ms to happen there has to be a defective 
blood brain barrier and this is one of the theories the one of the theories is that uh, the ms is caused one of the factors in your evolution of ms in the pathogenesis of ms is a defective blood brain barrier because that is how your effector t cells and plasma cells will enter into the brain now suppose there is a defect in the blood brain barrier and both of these now enter in now what happens just because they've entered the brain does not mean they should start harming the brain because remember that these are your body's own cells your effector t cells and plasma cells are formed by your own body so they will not attack your own body unless there is a specific part of this pathogen so let's say that there is a part like this and this part resembles a protein in the myelin so supposing in your brain if you have your myelin sheet if you have a myelin sheet around the axons and part of that myelin sheet is a protein that looks very similar to the pathogen then when the t effector cells and the plasma cells enter into the brain they will spot this pathogen they will spot this protein sorry they will spot this protein and they will immediately get triggered because now they remember the earlier infection so then they will consider this to be part of that infection and then they will attack okay now there is some more complexity to this of course so you have your immunoglobulins that first bind to this protein and then the immunoglobulin will ask the t effector cell should i attack because uh, there is always a uh, sort of a cross check mechanism but because the t effector cell is also convinced that this is a pathogen the t effector cell will give the permission for the immuno immunoglobulins to attack so that is how the uh, whole uh, pathogenesis happens but for now for the sake of this discussion uh, this much is enough we should just know that the one of the main theories of how ms uh, happens is that there is a pathogen your effector t cell and plasma cells uh, remember that pathogen there is a blood brain barrier defect they enter into the brain and it will cause local inflammation and one of the reasons why we think that there is a blood brain barrier defect is because in your brain if there is a small blood brain barrier here there will be entry here and there will be a focal damage here and eventually that damage will be controlled so there will be an attack and then after that attack the attack will remit so there will be remission and then after some time supposing there is another leak somewhere else then there will be another attack there so that means that there will be a relapse which is why one of the key features of multiple sclerosis is that there can be a relapsing remitting course <clears throat> now there is a lot that we still don't know in this uh, pathogenesis for example we don't know for certain what is this protein in the myelin we don't know what is the protein that is being attacked we don't know why the blood brain barrier becomes defective there are some theories but we are not still sure we don't know why there is only a focal inflammation and why the inflammation doesn't spread all over the brain and we don't know why there is recurring blood brain barrier defect so these are a lot of things that are still under research but overall this is the pathogenesis of uh 
multiple sclerosis and initially it will there will be an attack it will remit and then later on it might relapse what happens if this keeps happening eventually the remissions will stop so eventually once there is an attack there will be no remission because the damage is too much and whatever is that damage that has happened will continue it will sustain so if you look at it from a form of a graph if this is relapsing remitting it will look a bit like the graph will look like this so there will be an attack and then it will remit and then after some time the patient will be normal and then again there will be an attack again there will be a remission and so on but eventually it might lead to a place where the attacks will not remit completely and so the next time there is an attack the damage will be more and more until slowly it will start increasing like this okay so this is called as secondary progressive ms so secondary progressive so initially it was sort of like a relapsing remitting but then eventually it went into a continuous progression what if there is no relapsing remitting course in the middle what if right from the first attack the patient has symptoms like this this is known as primary progressive ms so there is no remission at all so there is no remission there is only attack and worsening attack and worsening now this is obviously a much more dangerous form of ms thankfully it is not as common as relapsing remitting so most of the patients of ms 85% of ms patients will have a relapsing remitting course but unfortunately out of those 85% almost two third of them will eventually become secondarily progressive that means that after a few years their uh, remissions will keep decreasing and the relapses will keep increasing and the remaining 15% will have a primary progressive ms feature so right from the first symptom they will not have any uh, remission they will only have worsening <clears throat> okay now since i have spoken about relapsing remitting secondary progressive and primary progressive there is one more term that i want you to know that is clinically isolated syndrome which in simple terms it is the first attack of ms so the first time a patient comes with something that can be multiple sclerosis we don't know so for example if we are looking at the patient here so at this stage we don't know how the progression can be we don't know if the progression will be remitting or it will be eventually secondary progressive or will it continuously progress so at the clinically isolated syndrome state we don't know if it will be a relapsing remitting or a ppms but at that point we can diagnose it as a clinically isolated syndrome okay now uh, let us talk about ms itself what happens in ms so what are the clinical features of ms so to understand this you have to know what what does an attack of ms do now we spoke about how your myelin sheath is attacked so here if there is an attack your myelin sheath will get uh, will form come under attack there will be inflammation around it and eventually your axon there might be an axonal damage but even before the axonal damage the the effect of the myelin attack is that your signals from the axon cell body is now not getting transmitted across 
So for all intents and purposes, it is like there is a block here. So the signals are not transmitting across. So the effect of that signal not getting transmitted across will completely depend on what signal is it. And by what signal is it, I mean which neuron is it, which axon is affected, and it is part of which network, which neural network. Now, supposing if this axon was part of your speech network, then the effect of this attack will be loss of speech. If this was part of your sensory network, then you will have sensory loss. If this was part of your motor network, then you will have weakness. So the presentation of multiple sclerosis completely depends on where is the lesion. Okay. So coming back to this, if there is a lesion in your motor cortex, that can be weakness. If there's a lesion in your sensory cortex, there can be sensory loss. If there is a lesion in your uh, temporal cortex, there could be a language problem. Or if there is a lesion deeper, then uh, correspondingly, there could be other issues. There could be emotional issues. There could be, uh, uh, there could be bladder problems. Similarly, it's not just your brain, but also your spinal cord. And in your spinal cord, you have all your tracts. So if your motor tract is involved, if your sensory tract is involved, if your autonomic tract is involved, all of them will have different effects. So roughly your main effects are motor, sensory, bladder bowel and sexual, and you can have generalized symptoms like fatigue. What are the uh, features of MS that you will not expect to see? So things that uh, you feel that cannot come in MS, or if you see those features, you will think this may not be MS. So one of them is a steady progression. So as I said, Primary progressive MS can present in a steady progressive way, but it is only 15%. So before you diagnose primary progressive MS, you need to rule out other causes of uh, progressive neurological disorder. Uh, another thing is age. So MS usually presents in young adults. So if you see a patient less than 10 years or more than 50 years presenting for the first time with MS, then it is a little rare. Uh, other features are cortical damage. Now, this is important to understand. What do I mean by cortical damage? You in your brain, you have the cortex outside and inside you have the subcortex. Now the cortex contains all your axons. Sorry, your cortex contains all your cell bodies. And you know that MS does not affect cell bodies. What does it affect? It affects the axons. So the uh, axons that leave the cell bodies because the axons have the myelin sheet. And all the axons are located more in your subcortex. So if there is an MS lesion, it is usually going to be in the subcortex, not in the cortex. And there are certain features of cortical damage versus subcortical damage. So your cortical damage can have things like aphasia. So you are unable to, so Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. So you are unable to understand or you're unable to speak. That is aphasia. You can have things like apraxia, which we discussed in our higher mental function testing. You have alexia, so that is difficulty in reading. Or you can have neglect, so hemi-neglect. That also we discussed in our higher mental function class. So these are all signs of cortical damage. So if you find something like this, 
then it is not likely to be MS because MS will affect your subcortex more. What else is unlikely to happen in MS? Convulsion, so that is seizure or even headache. So the reason seizures don't happen much is again because seizures happen more if there is cortical damage and uh, headache is very rarely seen in MS. So if there is headache, you are uh, likely to have something else other than MS. Now, what are the things that you will definitely think of MS? So if a patient comes with these findings, you will definitely think of MS. One is a phenomenon known as Lermit's sign. So what is Lermit's sign? Lermit's sign is a sudden lancinating shooting pain up your spine, usually because of neck flexion. So neck movement will precipitate a sudden pain up and down your spine. And uh, another phenomenon is known as Uthoff's phenomenon. And Uthoff's phenomenon is when your uh, features of MS, all your clinical findings of MS, will become more, it will worsen in warm exposure. So if you have a hot shower, then these patients can have increased clinical findings. And a couple of other things is optic neuritis. Now optic neuritis and INO is something I want to discuss separately. Optic neuritis, why you have your eyes, and your eyes are connected to the brain through your optic nerves. And your optic nerves also have myelin sheet around it. Right? So, one of the features of the myelin sheet around optic nerve is that this is also part of your central nervous system myelin. As opposed to all your other nerves, which has your peripheral nervous system myelin, your optic nerve has myelin, which is central nervous system. So this myelin can get affected in MS. So that is the reason optic neuritis is very common in multiple sclerosis. And INO is internal nuclear ophthalmoplegia. Now, this is a, a tricky concept and I'll try to explain it in as simple terms as possible. We already discussed eye movement. So if you haven't seen that, please go and see that on the YouTube channel because uh, you will need that information here. But we spoke about the final pathway of uh, your eye movement, which is in the brainstem. You have the sixth nucleus. And next to the sixth nucleus, you have something known as PPRF. And the PPRF has the function of moving both the uh, same side eye laterally and the opposite side eye medially. That means it can move the same side sixth nerve and the opposite side third nerve. And the way it does it is it connects to the opposite side third nerve via medial longitudinal fasciculus. So if there is a lesion in your medial longitudinal fasciculus, because this is also covered by the myelin sheet, so if there's a lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus, then your sixth nerve will act on the same eye, but your opposite eye will not turn. So that is known as internal nuclear ophthalmoplegia, uh, in which if you look to the right, then your right eye will look to the right, but your left eye will not look to the right because there is a disconnection problem. All right, so that completes the clinical features of MS. Uh, and uh, we also spoke about the classification of MS, that is uh, relapsing remitting, uh, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and clinically isolated. Now, I want to just touch upon the diagnosis 
I don't want to go too much in detail. We can you can read about it, but it is known as McDonald's criteria, and the basic concept is that you need to prove that the lesions are disseminated in time and disseminated in space. What does that mean? You need to prove that there are two lesions. and they have happened in two separate areas and they have happened at two different points in time because the first lesion we said is a clinically isolated syndrome so that does not make it a uh, full fledged ms so we are not sure yet so if you have a lesion here and you have a lesion here you need to prove that they are two separate lesions and that one of them happened first and the other one happened second so this is the basic concept of mcdonald's criteria you can read about it and uh, we can discuss it later <clears throat> now coming to uh, approach so how do you approach a case approach is in the same format history examination and investigation history the things that you ask for are motor sensory bladder symptoms and mainly optic neuritis so eye involvement so these are the four main things that you ask for and you ask for relapsing remitting course so usually you will always find that this patient has had a history before of one of these so they may i either have had a transient weakness or they may have had a transient sensory loss or transient visual problem or transient bladder or sexual dysfunction so this history is very important examination is to confirm your history findings and investigation is mainly through mri in which you will see the demyelination which will which will seem like a t2 hyperintense plaque and csf so csf is a, a lumbar puncture you check for cerebrospinal fluid and you check for signs of inflammation so if there is inflammation in your brain there will be some uh, evidence of that in your lumbar puncture fluid and the evidence they are looking for is known as oligoclonal bands so these are sort of remnants of immunoglobulins so if there has been a previous attack in the brain you can see oligoclonal band in the csf so uh, these are the two main investigations you can also do something known as vep that is visually evoked potential and this is to diagnose optic neuritis now finally coming to treatment treatment is divided into treatment of acute attack and uh, acute attack is mainly steroids <clears throat> okay so treatment of acute attack and disease modifying treatment so your acute attack is managed by Uh, injectable steroids and disease modifying therapy has oral and injectable and infusion now i don't want to go too much in uh, detail about each individual uh, type of uh, treatment options but uh, the main i'll just give you the names of the drugs and then you can uh, read about it the oral treatment is the options are dimethyl fumarate teriflunomide and fingolimod and uh, injectable injectable therapy is interferon beta 1a and glatiramer and infusion is through either natalizumab or recently approved drug is ocrelizumab so this is the uh, overall picture of multiple sclerosis we spoke about uh, what are the types of uh, demyelinating diseases uh, we spoke about uh, how there can be genetic diseases and uh, acquired diseases and acquired is called demyelination it can be because of autoimmune infection toxic and vascular ms is a type of autoimmune disorder we spoke about what is myelin how myelin is formed uh in central nervous system it is formed by oligodendroglycosides uh 
there is a protein in the myelin which is acted against by the immune system. We spoke about the pathogenesis, how an infection can trigger this autoimmune reaction via CD4 and B cells, mainly CD4 T cells, B cells that enter into the brain via defective blood brain barrier. And this will cause uh, damage to the myelin sheet and it may cause secondary axonal damage. Usually the attack will remit and then later on it will relapse again. So that is relapsing remitting type. If it stops uh, remitting, it will become a secondarily progressive type. And if it is never remitted, then it becomes a primary progressive. The first attack is known as clinically isolated syndrome. Clinical features is motor, sensory, bladder and fatigue. And it is usually a subcortical lesion. The red flag signs are uh, young age or old age. Uh, signs of cortical damage, convulsion and headache and your uh, the signs that you will definitely look for is Lermit sign, Eutoff's phenomenon, optic neuritis and INO. Optic neuritis because your optic nerve is damaged and INO because your uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus is damaged. The diagnosis criteria is called as McDonald's criteria. You need dissemination in time and dissemination in space. And uh, the approach is through history taking, examination, and investigation. Main investigations are MRI, CSF, and VEP. And treatment is divided into acute and uh, disease modifying therapy. So, this is uh, approach to multiple sclerosis. Uh, if there are any questions, you can ask me. So, increase in temperature slows down. Uh, no. So, the reason for that is uh, it's Considered that Utoff phenomenon is because of uh, because there is increased uh, temperature, your inflammation in that area increases, and uh, the the overall speed of conduction uh, decreases. So then these symptoms become more evident. So that is why uh, there is a correlation with temperature. All right, thank you all. Uh, on Sunday we will be discussing. Uh, neuroscience of emotions. So, thank you. Take care, everyone.